the best I'm blessed to know that lust is a test I used to be the victim now I'm just envisioning I'm knowing this is I'm Susie Landolfi and welcome to Be Crazy Well Now why would a therapist say that because we all have mental health struggles even therapists The good news is we have so much more information about how we can be crazy well On my podcast we don't focus on what's wrong with us we want to know what happened to us. We're going to explore how trauma affected us, both negatively and positively. That's right. I said positively. It's called post-traumatic growth, and it's a real thing. Be Crazy Well will share mental health wellness practices, the newest mental health research, and most importantly, how we all get to create the person we deserve to be and the life we deserve to live. So join the mental health evolution and be crazy well. Hi, welcome everybody. Welcome to Be Crazy Well. Why did I call it that? Because I think that we need to lessen the stigma that somehow we all have to be perfect or that there's this definitive line between being well and not being well. Everything's on a spectrum. So that means I'm well in some areas and not quite as well in others. It means that it fluctuates. It means that I can actually not be well and still be well in my wellness. It means that we can adjust, manage, and change how well we are. So I've always loved the word crazy. Uh, I think it's because I've never used the traditional definition of crazy. Uh, I think that there are people in the world that bring so much inspiration because they're willing to be different and they're disruptors. Some people would call them crazy. I happen to believe that they're inspirers, inspirators. Maybe that's a word that we can start to use. I'm an inspirator. Anyway, uh, be Crazy Well is about learning wellness practices. Now, I didn't get to where I am by just thinking myself well. I didn't get here by feeling myself well. I got here by doing differently, by doing well things, even when I didn't feel like it, even when I thought that it was a waste of time. Because I don't always trust all of my thoughts or all of my feelings. And that's because they were given to me by a family that struggled. They struggled mightily with their own wellness. So I learned things about myself, thoughts about myself and feelings about myself that were not true. So when I decided to create the person I deserve to be, I had to make sure I wasn't always following every thought I have. And I certainly wasn't gonna run my life by every feeling that I had. And what that did was help me understand what a true partnership looks like. And a true partnership starts with individuals. I love when Cahill Gibran in The Prophet talks about when you are in a marriage or a partnership, I like to use the word partnership, that if you want to hold up a large roof, you need to make sure the columns are far enough apart so that they can hold up the weight of that roof. If they're too close together, it's a very small roof that you can hold up. So when the snow gets on top of that roof, when I like to say the shit hits the fan, uh, we're not gonna be able to hold that up very well. So one of the things that I started to do was to list things that are clear about my wellness practice. So, so I'm gonna start to go through my list and I'm gonna share with you, these are the practices that I do all based on principles in order to create any kind of partnership, whether it's with a lover or with a friend or a coworker or a child, anybody in my life, this is what I do. So the first one is a commitment to your individual principles and healing has to come before a commitment to the partnership. There is no partnership without individual wellness. So I think sometimes we smother each other, that we are too enmeshed, we are codependent on one another, and we want to get our happiness and our wellness and our value from somebody else, instead of making sure that every day we're creating that ourselves. 
So I am always responsible for me, my physical, emotional, intellectual, spiritual, and even my resource wellness. And resources can mean everything from money all the way to my energy. How do I manage all of those things for myself? We don't control anyone except ourselves. That's so important. I was just noticing that I got distracted because I wasn't sure I was actually recording this. If I don't record it, we can't share this with you. So we don't control anyone except ourselves. Now, look, uh, if you looked up the word controlling uh, many years ago, you would have seen my picture there. I was trained in my childhood to control things. Why? Because the adults were out of control. So children oftentimes learn and train are trained to be controlling because of the chaos in their life. And that was certainly my story. So I really had to bite, it's still hard. I had to bite that uh, lip till it almost bled before I would say things that were inappropriate and trying to control another human being. It can be a myriad of ways that we try to control. We can give unasked for advice. And by the way, unasked for advice, is criticism. Now, when I first heard that, I was like, eh, I don't believe it. And I'm just trying to help. That's what I would say. My intentions. <laughs> you know what? Forget the intentions. If someone doesn't ask me for my advice, I don't give it. Unless it's going to help save their life, like get out of the way, a car is coming. I'm not giving anybody advice unless they ask for it, especially the people I live with. Now you say, well, what about children? Well, it's even better to have a discussion with them about choices and consequences than to actually tell them what to do and what not to do. Certainly when they're younger, I'm not gonna let my grandson run out into the street. I am going to pick that child up if it's running and bring it back to safety, even if they don't like it. But as they get older, my job is to help them control themselves by connecting to their principles because they want to do something that is effective. Now their risk level might be higher than mine. So I'm noticing that with my own grandson right now, he's driving. So I would venture to say that there's times I might share some wisdom if he asks, and I always ask first. I said, do you wanna hear my opinion? If he says, no, I don't give it. If it affects me and my well being, then we have to have a discussion. So I want us to kind of, it's a very gray area, it's really hard, and it's an incremental lessening of how we manage keeping our children safe, certainly in our partnerships. Right now, even at work, I don't give and ask for advice. I do not, if to my daughter, I do not, she's an adult. And I make sure that when I take care of myself, it's interesting how much other people take care of themselves. So I'd much rather model me caring for myself and connecting to others than trying to control somebody else. And connection is always better than control. It's what we need for physical, emotional, intellectual, spiritual wellness. Connection is always more important than control. I have another one here. I read a book years ago called uh, Punished by Rewards. It's by Elfie Cohn, and it was written many years ago. And he's a father and he was also a corporate consultant. And he realized that incentives don't work. He said that reward and punishment in and of itself lessens the chance that people will do things because it's the right thing to do, because it's based on their principles. Most of the time when we use reward and punishment, people are trying to get the reward or avoid the punishment. That's not always a good idea. What if someone offers a greater reward are they going to change their behavior and their principles based on that? Or do we get to do what's best based on our own principles? So I say punishment doesn't work, neither does reward. Acting according to principles is the reward. And not acting according to our prin principles is the punishment. We don't feel great about ourselves when we go against everything that we believe to be true. I, one of my big principles is honesty and another one is equanimity. So when I'm not truly honest with myself or others, I don't feel great. And equanimity, the idea that everybody is of equal value, that's what I base my life on. That's what I be, base my behavior on. 
Uh, the third one is once acknowledged and admitted, do not bring up the past. We can't change it. It makes us self-righteous and makes us forget our part and our commitment to change. And I was the best about remembering the history of what someone else did to me or didn't do. And all it did was make me unaware and unappreciative and it made me living in the past and I was missing the present. I actually, I think the worst part about living in the past or bringing up the past is I'm not seeing the progress of the present. People change, even if it's incremental. It's important to understand that we all change. Sometimes we take three steps forward and two back, but we still made that step forward. So for me, I know that bringing up the past is futile in terms of how it's going to change anything about my present day, about my thoughts and my feelings and my actions. So only my actions today with somebody else or with myself is going to make any great change in my life. I got this one from the Marines. Um, slow is smooth, smooth is fast. Now, when I heard that, I, I was like, oh my God, why didn't I hear this like 30 years ago? So that I could have slowed down to be smoother, smoother physically, emotionally, intellectually, spiritually, and financially. So I always was under the impression that fast is great and faster is even better. And I got that because I was brought up in a very anxious household. I was brought up in a household where I had to take the mantle and the behavior of being the overachiever. So anxiety pushed me all the time to go fast. Consequently, I was not smooth. <laughs> it was not something you would say about me. Even my mom said there were times that even though I was a dancer, she would call me Grace sort of jokingly because I would always trip was because I was moving faster than my mind and my feet could connect to one another. I used to lose things, break things, miss things, um, not be able to uh, take care of my calendar. Uh, the worst thing is I wore myself out. I literally wore myself out by going too fast. So now for me, I love the idea that I'm slowing down. I love the idea that I can take a breath, that I can take a break. I love the idea that if someone asks me something, I can say, you know, let me think about that for a while. I'll get back to you. What a concept. The idea that almost everything that I do on a daily basis is not life-threatening. Therefore, I can take time and go slowly and be smoother and almost everything that I do. This one I got from Al-Anon, I love this one. Be the partner you want to have. I love it now, I hated it then, why? Because I wanted them to do what I wanted them to do and give me what I wanted them to give me. I wanted them to be the partner that I wanted to have. And I didn't wanna necessarily take a look at how I wasn't the partner that I wanted to have. If we truly want to be the best we can be, we don't get to yell, swear in anger, or name call. So those are like three just so important things to me. I'm from Boston. We literally call ourselves mass holes. And uh, we're really proud of how kind of coarse we are. <laughs> I would have to say that coarse and crude in many ways. And that means that we yell a lot. We also swear a lot. If you don't believe me, just watch the movie Ted. That's like a documentary from those of us from Boston. So. I realize that I don't have to yell if someone's standing right in front of me. They can hear me. So if I'm yelling, I'm trying to overpower them and it can be abusive for sure. So yelling, unless they're far away, not gonna happen anymore for me and it hasn't for years. Swearing in anger. Notice I didn't say don't swear. I just said don't swear in anger. Once again, being from Boston, I have to tell you, swearing is kind of like our love language. So as long as it's not in anger, you can use some swear words and some words that make each other laugh, even if they seem a little bit off color to the general public, uh, that's your right. But what I never do is I never swear, I never up the ante or the heat in the situation by using any words that could possibly push it into the, the what I would call the danger zone. And the third one is no name calling. So once again, from Boston and being half Italian, uh, 
you know, name calling again is kind of like one of those ways we tease each other. It's again, another love language in many families that we tease each other and call each other um, funny names. Again, in anger, all bets are off. So those are called principles and rules of engagement. And one of the things I loved about being around military men and women is that they understood the rules of engagement. They understood that what could uh, escalate the, the battle or help to de-escalate the battle. So for me, those are the three things I make sure never happens when I start to get sad and scared in a discussion with somebody, no yelling, no swearing and anger and no name calling. The second part of that is no blaming or shaming. Now, trust me, I love to blame. I mean, who wants to take the rap? I never want to know that I'm wrong. That's so difficult to, to be wrong. I was made wrong my whole life by my father. So I'm very adverse to being wrong. I was also shamed by him. That There was this whole idea that somehow I, as a child, did something to make him feel terrible about me or embarrassed him, or caused him not to be proud of me. That couldn't be further from the truth. Children can't do that to us unless we train them how to do that. It's not our job as parents to have children that make us proud. We're supposed to be proud of how we're behaving, not necessarily how everybody else is behaving. And when we behave well, it's a much better chance that our children will model what we are doing. We have a better chance. I'm not saying it happens all the time. I'm saying that it can give them some incentive in a way that just means a lot more to them, some, some kind of reward or punishment, or the idea that we have to blame them into doing well or shame them into doing well. Oftentimes when my grandson is struggling, I ask him, how can I help? Like, well, okay, get a D. What happened? Is there any way I can help you? What is your plan? What do you want to do about it? Do you understand why you got a D or are you really confused? I mean, I don't understand why we have to come at somebody right away and assume that somehow this was all intentional, that it was there to get us upset. That is not how you have a partnership. You ask questions, get more information and let them come up with the solution. All right, two more. If you don't know what to do, be kind. It's that simple. When I don't know what to do, I'm just kind. Sometimes I'm kind quietly. Sometimes I, again, are kindly ask questions with no idea of what I want for an answer. Now, like, don't ever ask a kid or anybody an answer that you, a question that you already know the answer of. I love this one. If you've done your homework, you know they have it. Don't ask. That's kind of like lying. And so what I do is if I don't know what to do in a situation, oftentimes people call me and say, I don't know what to do. I said, well, the first thing to do is to be kind. Be kind to yourself and be kind to the other person. Be respectful. Get more information. When I don't know what to do, I wait. That's another thing I learned in the military. Oftentimes I've heard um, these amazing men and women talk about a situation they were in and the plan wasn't going as uh, according to what the plan was and they didn't know what to do. And not always, but many times you have enough time to get more information before you actually decide what to do. Sometimes you won't. Sometimes you'll have to just act immediately. But most of the time in our family life and our family situation, we can just wait and be kind until we know what to do. Give each other reflection time and talk later. That's another thing you can do when you don't know what to do. When you're having a discussion with someone and you guys can't find any common ground at all, give yourself a time out. It's for, you know, like, hey, wait, let's, let's put this on hold. We don't have to decide this right now. Uh, and I'm going to go reflect on my part and what's happening for me. And you do the same and we'll come back and talk later. Imagine if you came back with more insight into yourself than to what the other person was doing or not doing. That's how it works better for a partnership. When each individual takes a look at themselves and decides what they could do better, what was happening to them, why they reacted the way that they did. And then you guys can come up with an opportunity to come to some kind of an agreement or solution better. And even if you don't for a while, at least you're gaining insight 
personal insight. And uh, the last one that I'm always clear about in any partnership is always own your part first. <laughs> so trust me, I don't want to be, I don't want to be on the end when someone goes and you did this and you did that and you did this. I want to be the person that said, whoa, T.O., time out. I just realized what I did. Like, this is what I did. I call it owning your shit. <laughs> and I, I think that it's one of the greatest healing wellness practices for me. Having been abused as a child by my dad, who always made me wrong and always made it about me, I was so adverse to being wrong. I would do anything to not be wrong. And I was terrified of owning my mistake. I, I, mistakes meant that I could get hit or hugged. It, it just didn't matter in my family. So uh, any way that I could make sure that I wasn't wrong, I did for a long time. So now I love this idea of that I'm going to own what I did. I'm going to own my shit before anybody else can point it out. I was the clinical director of a wonderful treatment center in Malibu called Oro. At the time, it was called Acadia. They've changed their name to Oro, Oro Recovery Centers. And I remember the very first staff meeting that I held. I probably had 30 people in the room. They didn't know me at all. And I said, okay, welcome. I'm Suzanne, your new clinical director. And here's what we're going to do to start off the meeting to get to know each other. We're going to share a mistake that we made this, year, this week. So everybody, we're going to go around the room and we're all going to share a mistake we made well, you can only imagine the looks on their faces. They were horrified, terrified, you know, talk about knowing that all of a sudden the clinical director must be crazy uh, and, <laughs> and dangerous. And I said, I'll go first. And so I went first and I explained that I fell asleep in a session, but I literally nodded off and the poor client got all upset and hurt, just like, oh, that's what my mom used to do and my dad. Anyway, it was a mess. And I owned it and I shared with them what I had done. Then we went to the two young owners, two young guys from uh, Canada, and they started to own their mistakes. So now you've got the three people running this place, owning their mistakes. By the, about the time we got to the fourth person, we were laughing. And everybody was excited to share because all of a sudden they realized this wasn't about punishment. This wasn't about being written up. This was about creating a safe place. So I made a deal with them. I said, while you're working here with me, I want everybody to feel safe enough and know it's safe, not just feel that it's safe, but know that it's safe to come to me when you've made a mistake. In fact, I want you to get to me before anybody else tells me or a client tells me. Make sure you do. And uh, a funny story, I actually saw a, a staff member walking down the hall really fast one day and I said, slow down, slow down, I'm not going anywhere. And he said, I had to make sure I got to you first and told you and owned my mistakes. I want you to hear it from me. Uh, it, it was such a wonderful way to work and such a wonderful way to build a team. I wish I had had it many years ago when I was growing up. It would have made my whole family would have been safer and easier. And they would have been uh, crazy well better. They were just crazy. And so it would have been crazy. Well, uh, I love them dearly. And it was certainly a difficult, difficult time uh, for them uh, to, to be afraid of making mistakes. So those are my sort of wellness practices that I do on a daily basis with any partnership that I'm uh, dealing with, even when I'm at the checkout counter. Like that's a partnership, we're in a transaction. We need to get some stuff done. We need to get my groceries paid for and in the bag so I can get out the store. So it doesn't even matter. These can work anywhere in any part of your life. And let me know, email me. We always put up my email. I'm very excited to get emails from all of you and I'm always will answer back. Uh, and I'm so appreciative to be part of Coming Home Well and this entire organization, all the other podcasts. I hope you're listening to all the other ones. I'm learning so much from my fellow podcasters uh, from Coming Home Well. And remember, be crazy well and be your best self. And that is the title of the theme song. That theme song is an original song by Calvin Love. He's a, a remarkable young man. And he gave me that song to be able to use uh, for this podcast. And uh, I am so grateful. So check him out on Spotify and every other place that you listen to music. And we'll come back next week because, you know, we're still working on being crazy well.
and just be it. Be crazy well. All right. Have a great week, everybody. Bye-bye.